So this is the future round table on a dream falling apart, the deepening crisis of the international and European order. So I'm very happy and proud that our institute is hosting this general conference after a couple of years. I'm also personally excited to be hosting this one round table. Uh, I do research on international institutions and on global flows of information. Uh, I'm the PI of a project called Glowin for global flows of information. I'm going to be hosting this and I'm going to start by introducing the speakers on the round table. Okay, so our first speaker on the roundtable is going to be Aisha Zarakol. Uh, she is the Professor of International Relations at the University of Cambridge. She has done extensive work in the recent years, not only in recent, but also in hierarchies uh, in the international order, the recognition of states in the international order, and on uh, orders, international orders in general, and non-Western orders in particular. She has published extensively on that, uh, most recently a uh, monograph before the West with Cambridge University Press just last year. She's the associate editor at International Organization, so on my left. Then, uh, still to the left, is Ilke Dijkstra, Professor of International Security and Cooperation at Maastricht University. Uh, he has uh, researched extensively in the European Union, especially in the domain of security, international organizations, the death and life of international organizations and multilateralism at large. He's just concluding his ERC project on the decline and death of IOs. He's editor at Contemporary Security Policy. Next is Stephanie, who has just put herself on the slide. And Stephanie is professor of international relations at the European University. Uh, Institute in Florence. She researches regime complexes, international security, European Union and security and the international order as well. She has published uh, extensively on that uh, with a monograph uh, with Cambridge University Press and recently a number of, uh, uh, number of top journals. And last but not least, uh, Tom Hale. Uh, is professor in global public policy at the University of Oxford. Uh, yes research and again published on uh, global uh, governance and global institutions and uh, in particular in the last year with a focus on uh, the climate change and on COVID and yes again there's a number of books with Cambridge University Press with policy uh, um, papers in uh, uh, journals that are not that frequent in political science perhaps such as science and nature climate change and he is uh, working or finishing his the man manuscript of a new book called Long Problems to be published with uh, with the Princeton University Press next year. So these are our four speakers. And now let's get to what they will be actually talking about today. So this panel is about the international order and the key feature of international order, of any international order, but in particular of the one that we live in now is to what extent it allows for cooperation, to what extent it is cooperative, to what extent it encourages states to engage in joint problem solving, and encourage openness of the borders. Right. So we have a functional demand, as we know, we have a functional demand in an increasingly interdependent world for cooperation. But on the other hand, we also see a growing conflict and the current order is becoming uh, more fractured and more conflictual, uh, perhaps than, uh, than ever in the last three decades. Right. Uh, we have seen it in, on the diplomatic level uh, in recent uh, days with the BRICS summit in Johannesburg, uh, with an explicit ambition to challenge and reshape the current order. We were gonna likely see it, at least on a symbolic level, this weekend uh, in New Delhi with the G20 summit, uh, where notably not only the Russian, but also the Chinese leader is going to be absent. And of course, being in Prague, uh, we see it in particular in Europe and Central and Eastern Europe with uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine a uh, year and a half ago. So we have a tension, we have a problem. On the one hand, in a globalized world, we need cooperation. On the other hand, we see that states are increasingly unwilling to engage in deep uh, institutionalized cooperation. So how we go about it? Does the conflict trump the cooperation? If yes, we are screwed. I mean, that's kind of the bottom line of this panel. And the purpose of this panel and the task for the speakers will be to try to help us understand the causes of the growing conflicts and the prospects for cooperation actually prevailing of, over conflict or vice versa. And second, we will want to have a look at specifically Europe and the European Union in this, in this game. So what position and what steps the EU can take. Now to facilitate the debate, to help us all get a focused debate on, on uh, these uh, pretty 
disturbing and deep issues. I formulated uh, two questions uh, to the roundtable participants, and I will ask them to address them in, the, in their introductory remarks. And the first one, actually it's a double question, right? So I'm hiding two within one, is what key forces have made the international order less cooperative in the last decade? What forces may help drive the international order towards more cooperation rather than less in the coming years? So this is our research question one. Our research question two is going to be what steps may European states and the EU take to support a more cooperative international order rather than a more conflictual one. So this is like the more policy oriented, what should actually be done to deal with these questions. Okay, that's our research question two. Now I will pa pass the floor to the speakers. I'm gonna give everyone uh, 10 minutes for their introductory remarks. They are free to prioritize one of the questions at the expense of the other. They are uh, free to focus on a specific policy domain. They're free to do pretty much whatever they want as long as they stick to the 10 minutes limit. We are going to go in the order in which I introduce the speaker. So we are going to uh, start with Aisha, then go to Hilke, then Stephanie and Tom. I will ask you, uh, I will ask them to speak to the mic. Oh, we had some uh, audio issues uh, uh, yesterday, so I will try to, uh, to make sure that uh, everybody also at the back of the room can hear them wave at me if you cannot, right? That's going to be very helpful. And while they will be speaking, I will ask you, the audience, to think about possible questions that you might want to ask them after we finish. We are going to jump to the audience questions straight after the, after the initial, after the initial remarks. So think about the good questions and good questions in this context are going to be questions that are sharp, but also short. So, uh, please, uh, bear that in mind. So thanks a lot for coming. Thanks a lot for being here with us. And Aisha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michal. Uh, and hello, everyone. Um, because of my last name, I usually go last, uh, and I was assuming uh, the same would happen here. So my plan was to be the provocative fourth speaker. <laughs> Instead, you know, I was informed right before the panel started that I'm going to be first. So I guess I will be the provocative first speaker and let the other panelists um, deal with it as they may. So uh, as you see from uh, the slide uh, in the back, um, Michal has given us two prompts. Uh, uh, what key forces have made the international order less cooperative in the last decade? Uh, what can we do about this in the future? And what can Europe specifically do? I will take each of these questions in turn. And I will start by uh, kind of disagreeing <laughs> with the premise of the first question. Uh, so I don't think the... Uh, international order has become less cooperative in the last decade. I think it was never that cooperative. Uh, there were various uh, uh, forces and dynamics that were uh, masking the fact that it wasn't really a cooperative order. Uh, so what has happened in the last decade is that uh, those un underlying uh, dynamics have become visible uh, but they were always there. I don't think this is a recent uh, recent development. Uh, and by by that I mean uh, the it, I mean what we call the international order or a cooperative international order, liberal international order, rules based international order. You know, we have all these fancy names for it. But much of the rest of the world, outside of Europe and the West, experiences this as a Western order, and that's what they call it. Uh, that's how they talk about it, uh, if they ever you know, talk about it. Uh, I'm originally from Turkey. I've never heard the international order be called the liberal international order in Turkey, uh, except maybe in academic circles that are speaking in translation mode. Um, it's always the West, right? So uh, there are uh, a lot of resentments about the way the international order works uh, outside of Europe, especially, but also in Europe. I mean, I think we could put um, uh, parts of Europe in, in this uh, mix as well. Uh, these res resentments go back decades, if not uh, centuries in some cases. Uh, they were always there. So the, the buy-in, uh, the, the willingness to cooperate, the willingness to uphold, you know, the principles and the rules of this order has always been exaggerated, uh, uh, especially in the IR uh, literature. 
Uh, so why, you know, why was the rest of the world kind of going along with this order before the last decade? Uh, and why are they now not? Uh, I mean, we can point to many factors, but obviously, you know, bipolarity <laughs> is one of them for those that were, uh, you know, in the order uh, that preceded this one. Uh, you know, having to pick camps or, you know, the fear of the other side. Obviously, that was part of it. I mean, I'm, I'm not a realist, but that's part of that dynamic. The economic promise, you know, if you join this order, uh, you know, there's upward mobility. You can participate in the benefits, the various goods uh, and the economic uh, benefits of this order. Uh, again, premised on the idea that inclusion means real inclusion and real upward mobility, which can really be debated uh, in a, with uh, the exception of, you know, some cases, but often overlooked also, I think, you know, the epistemic or, or the ontological power <laughs> of the West. Since the 19th century, uh, the, you know, the world has been centered in the West uh, and the rest of the world, um, you know, you know, has uh, maybe a love-hate relationship uh, with the West, but they can, they haven't been able to ignore it. So there is, even with the enemies, uh, there is always an orientation towards the West and a concern about what the West is doing. Uh, and I think these dynamics were under writing uh, a lot of what looked like, you know, rational <laughs> cooperation, uh, et, et cetera. Um, so what has changed uh, in the last decade, uh, you know, obviously, um, the, um, I mean, everybody can point to uh, changes in those variables that uh, I've named, uh, but I think two things are going hand in hand. One is uh, the, you know, the increasing weakness of the center, uh, which is visible for all to see in all, all, all respects. Um, coupled with the increasing agency of the, <laughs> the previously non-central uh, regions uh, and countries. So, you know, examples for the increasing weakness of the center, uh, you know, the in obviously um, decreasing uh, in especially relative terms uh, of, um, you know, economic power uh, of the West, uh, general, uh, you know, view or picture of incompetence or chaos uh, in uh, Western capitals, uh, from the US to, you know, various parts of Europe, uh, you know, mismanagement, I suppose, of uh, for some time, like, or many debates about, you know, COVID, et cetera, pandemic, like, not that, you know, the rest of the world was that much better, but this general sense that the West is not really ahead or better than <laughs> other parts of the world, uh, which was kind of like a legacy impression anyway. But uh, I think the uh, developments in the last decade uh, have made that uh, uh, visible. I mean, the, the, that epistemic power or whatever you call it, that social power is still there. Uh, so you still have, uh, you know, uh, people traveling here, investing, you know, going to our <laughs> the, the Western institutions of you know, higher, higher learning, but it's, it's waning. Uh, and I think that has effects on, uh, on foreign policy choices as well. And, uh, you know, coupled with increasing agency, I mean, that's some of that increasing agency comes from the realization, uh, I think, in other parts of the world that, uh, you know, the EU or the West may uh, talk about conditions uh, for economic investments and, you know, talk about promoting democracy, et cetera, or, but really, you know, money comes uh, uh, from the West and elsewhere. Um, and, you know, in the case of Russia, in the case of Turkey and other places, uh, especially after the, the financial crisis, um, you know, a lot of these places, the countries did better uh, in comparison um, for a while, there was, you know, uh, influx of, you know, funds, etc. I, I mean, I'm not an uh, IP person. My, my point is that the the economic environment uh, and uh, 
you know, the, the West's willingness to make deals uh, that are contrary to all the uh, the rhetoric um, has increased, greatly increased, I think, the maneuvering room of uh, politicians uh, outside of the West that we sometimes call, you know, autocrats, strongmen, etc. The fact is they are, they have, a, you know, kind of a free reign and really there is really no check on uh, what they're doing. Uh, so that obviously, you know, couple, uh, has eroded uh, this uh, pretense of, you know, uh, the, the the West is the center, and we're all cooperating in order to uphold the rules-based international order. Now, coming to you know the other questions, what forces may help drive the international order towards more cooperation rather than less in the coming years? I actually think more cooperation in the international order in the next years will happen, but it's not necessarily good news uh, for the West or Europe, because I think more cooperation will happen as we are already seeing this, you know, with BRICS and other efforts, more cooperation will happen outside the West, against the West. Um, and uh, this was always, you know, since the 19th century, one advantage Western countries had, and Europe has had, is acting as a group facing the rest of the world, whereas the rest of the world has been kind of parceled out and acting kind of unilaterally, or they are in bilateral challenges with the West. Uh, I think what we're going to see is a trend towards cooperation uh, that is anti-Western. Uh, so we can debate that uh, you know, in the Q&A section, but I think that will happen. Uh, I'm almost done. Uh, and finally, you know, what can Europe do <laughs> uh, to, or uh, the EU can do to support a more cooperative international order? As I said, I'm, uh, you know, I think maybe the ship has sailed in uh, salvaging that, uh, that cooperation that supports, uh, you know, the old order. Um, I mean, one thing that Europe can do is be more honest uh, about, you know, looking after its own interest when it does. Because one of the, and I've written about this, one of the things that uh, non I mean, anti-Western leaders really uh, draw upon is this idea of European or Western hypocrisy. That you know, Europe looks or looks out for its own, for Ukraine, etc. Uh, but then at the same time, you know, speaks of a you know universal order or a, you know <laughs> a global order, uh, and constantly pointing out to the double standards and the hypocrisies of Europe uh, is a ploy <laughs> that leaders like Putin and others use a lot. So maybe you know it's fine to look out for European interests. Maybe. Just be more honest about it <laughs> and, you know, uh, stem that uh, hypocrisy charge play uh, at its root. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, so we are already starting with the with the real debate here. OK, Hilke, do you want to take it on? I mean, I think this is really great being second, um, because I think you give me a lot to, to react to. Um, I was planning to be a bit more optimistic today uh, about the future of international order. Um, and it's essentially a very simple liberal institutionalist type of argument. Um, when I look around the globe, I see too many cross-border cooperation problems that demand cooperation. Um, and I also see a whole dense net um, a web of global governance, global governance institutions that are doing more or less a decent job in addressing a number of these, these problems. I don't think these institutions are going to go anywhere. Um, now I'm getting to these type of uh, headline conclusions um, based on a five-year ERC project, which uh, Michael nicely mentioned in the beginning, um, which we're about to conclude. Now we... This doesn't work? All right. Um, so we started this, this project um, right after Brexit uh, referendum, right after the election of, of Trump, um, obviously also the BRICS Durban challenge after the economic financial crises. Um, and at that moment in time, so we're talking 17, 18, um, we had the impression that the whole house of 
of global governance was really coming down. Um, so we studied in this project um, really how historically international organizations as cornerstones um, of global governance um, have declined um, and have died. Now, five years on, as we're concluding this project, um, we really come to the conclusion that, that not that many in international organizations have actually declined um, or died uh, since they were created um, in, in the Treaty of Vienna uh, in the beginning of the 19th century. Um, so, for instance, while a quarter of international organizations that have been created over the last 200 years um, are no longer with us, that is quite a substantial number, right? A quarter of international organizations. Um, it's mostly the very small ones that have been terminated. So when you take a threshold of about 50 staff members, so if you only look at international organizations for which 50 staff members work, um, we only find that about 5% of international organizations have been terminated over the last 200 years. So 5% is really you know, about outliers. And even if you look at those outliers, really zoom in, look at what happened to these organizations, you see replacements, both formally and informally. Um, it's as simple as that. You know, There are some governance functions around the world. The world needs to be governed and other institutions step in. So we see a tremendous amount of continuity um, in international governance. Um, essentially since the Treaty of Vienna 200 years ago. Um, what we've also noticed in the project is that international organizations deal remarkably well with some of these challenges. If you think of the Trump administration um, challenging NATO uh, or even the climate regime, you know, you have the world's most powerful member state hegemonic within NATO and it didn't, you know, end this type of of international regimes or international organizations. But also more broadly, if you think about the World Bank dealing with you know, Chinese-led AIIB, you know, and there was a time where, where scholars were debating whether you know, these Chinese-led institutions would actually take over some of, some of these Western's created institutions and simply hasn't, hasn't happened. They have adapted, they have resisted, um, and I think they're still, still around. Um, so, Overall, my general assessment really after this, this project is relatively bright. Um, international organizations over the last 200 years have survived world wars. They have survived um, the Cold War, the end of the Cold War. They have survived a period of decolonization in which the number of you know, states in the international system increased tremendously. They have survived various economic crises. So I'm pretty positive that you know they will survive the expansion of the BRICS forum with the likes of Egypt um, and and Iran as well. So I don't really see that as as fundamental um, to the system that that we're currently having. Um, may, maybe two final concluding thoughts on on this, um, where where I do see real challenging emerging. Now, many, many of you here in the room will be familiar with the type of distinction made by, by Cohen defining international institutions and John Ruggie defining multilateralism. Um, and I think when we're talking about crisis of, of, of international order, we are really much more talking about the type of multilateral values um, being challenged and the type of international cooperation challenges being, being challenged. And I think you made that point as well, that we might actually see, see more cooperation in, in the um, in the near future. But I think my argument here would be really that we, as an EU, as Europe, as, as the West, perhaps should reinvest in some of these formal, robust, um, multilateral institutions. And that's not a very popular thing to say. I think a lot of, a lot of states have, uh, Western states have chosen shortcuts. Um, I know about the informal institutions, about ad hoc institutions, Benjamin about the low cost um, institutions as, as well. Um, but I would really think that we need to reinvest in, in the multilateral, you know, multilateralism at 193. Um, second, and I think that's where for me there, there's another key challenge, is I think um, international organizations have been rather robust um, when dealing with existing challenges. Um, and also Europe and the EU have really you know, carried through cooperation in, in some of these institutions during the difficult years of the Trump administration. Um, where for me the real challenge is, is in extending global governance, dealing with some of the new and emerging challenges 
um, that come on the international agenda. Um, you know, cyber, artificial intelligence, a new pandemic treaty, um, but above all, obviously, climate change and, and, and biodiversity, about which, uh, which Tom will talk a little bit later. I mean, I think also there, you know, Tom's work on, on gridlock, I think, is, is a really key concept. You know, the question, are we moving quickly enough um, to deal with some of those, those challenges? And the answer probably is, is no. Um, so I think while, you know, um, uh, we see all these, you know, um, challenge around doom and gloom in the, in the newspapers. Um, I think we shouldn't overreact. Um, I think we should also take a good look at what we have, um, try to defend that, try to further develop it, um, make it better, um, and, um, yeah, uh, have some faith in, in those global governance institutions um, that they will serve us reasonably well over the, over the coming decades. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Hilke, also for sticking uh, to the time limit. So we are going to uh, go to, to Stephanie. So your 10 minutes start right now. Thanks. Thank you very much. Is this loud enough? Please better look at you. Still louder? OK. Uh, so Micha, thank you so very much for the invitation to speak at this panel. Very exciting. And I'm going to start off a little bit like Aisha by actually questioning the premise of the first question about the cooperation that is in decline. But like Hilke, I'm going to talk more about the cooperation I actually see. So I'm trying to combine maybe a few things that already have been discussed. Apologies for that. Um, and because I think, and in a way, your PowerPoint already said this too, that actually cooperation and conflict can exist in parallel. And where I want to push for a little bit more is where, where cooperation actually can take place. So we see conflict, but maybe that's a particular European or Western perspective. And overall, we see more cooperation. And why do I say this? So admittedly, when I started thinking more, working more, not only on Europe, but but the international or the global level, um, I found it very hard to grasp what creates this kind of structure where rules apply for everyone that creates this kind of togetherness that we qualify as order. Order, and even if you look at the special issue uh, uh, in I.O. that both Tom and I should contribute to, um, there's talk about order, and then within that order, we have sub-orders, so very structured. Granted, I mean, I can think of quite a few global experiences that, that are shared more or less um, around the globe. There's or has been for quite a while this hegemonic power, the U.S., that has helped structure something we could maybe call international order. Then we have international global organizations. I've lived in Geneva for a long time. The WTO comes to mind, but maybe also UNCTAD, the ITU and WIPO. Um, we can talk about this later, or the World Bank that help in a way try some kind of pattern. Yes, climate change definitely is a, is a global experience. And then we associate order also with certain principles that often resonate with a liberal international order. But especially when we think about these principles, and Aisha already talked about this as well, um, they often are more aspirational, rhetorical, hypocritical uh, than we might wish for. And even when we think about power and institutions, I think it's not hard to point out how they've been contested uh, and pluralistic for quite a long time already. So there's more complexity maybe than we sometimes want to admit to when we talk about the order. So at least where I sit, which is uh, worked mainly on security policy and crisis management, I find it hard to find this international pattern rule-based order, no matter what gives, what structures this order. Instead, for me, it's much easier to think of ordering as a process. And so I, I can observe easily different ordering aspirations that are being articulated in different international organizations, but also outside of them. So as somebody, again, who works on security and crisis management, China, for example, is often being discussed as having a develop developmental peace approach, right? That differs from Russia's sphere of influence approach, which again differs from at least for a while we were talking about the liberal peace approach that often the US and Europe adhere to to some degrees. And so these aspirations actually exist in parallel. They exist in parallel at the UN. So when you look at UN Security Council debates, all of these exist, but you don't have only have to look at the UN, UN Security Council. Once the UN Security Council decides to launch a peace operation, hasn't done so in a while, um, 
then actually when it comes to the financing, there's a huge hackle over how many human rights officers you can send to an operation. So what does Europe have to give to China or Russia, for example, if this happens? So these different aspirations are coming in all the time. And then, of course, we have plenty of different regional arrangements that also can engage in peace operations and foster these aspirations. So just to say, like, what to me, this is more ordering than a particular sense of order um, that we are observing. So apologies to tell you that I have a hard time defining order in the first place and that I find ordering an easier concept. But I think if we if we think less about order and more about ordering, this question about the decline of cooperation gets a new meaning because we actually can observe cooperation in some parts of the world and maybe more conflictive interactions in other parts of the world. So I do think that at first question actually um, is a pretty Western question. It's asked from the West, right? From the perspective of the West. We had it fairly well, especially since the end of the Cold War, and now we observe more conflict. So what's going on? But the rest of the world might actually not agree with that kind of question um, because the vantage point is just different. So my first point really is, depending on your vantage point, ordering is more or less cooperative. And given that there is no single order, some actors have experienced this ordering in very different ways. If we think, for example, of the 1990s, which have been dubbed often the golden age of cooperation or by others, the end of history, whatever that means, but we can get to this. Those who I think lived in Somalia, in Congo, but also in the Balkans will not remember this as a cooperative experience in the international world. It's us in Western Europe who actually remember this as a cooperative experience, both on the national and the international level. Um, so while actually the European Union, Europeans and the Americans experienced at least relative peace, they were also the ones who tried to define international policy challenges and solutions a certain way, given their vantage point. We can think, for example, about the migration problem, as it's called in Europe, which could be called humanitarian crisis in other places, right? So in a way, that already shows it. Secondly, um, I think what we, and it has been talked about already, Cooperation actually exists in many parts of the world. I mean, Aisha actually in her work, but also Laura Viola, or Christina Davis have shown that um, cooperation exists, but it's not equally accessible for everyone, right? We have clubs that exist and persist. And just a few days ago, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres was tweeting, and here I quote, global governance structures reflect the world as it was, not as it is. We see this injustice playing out in the African context today. So there are certain structures we see that are rigid, and then there are new structures and new organizational formats that are being created. They require resources. Not everybody has access to the same kind of resources. Just, I mean, Hilke talked about bureaucracies. There's bureaucratic resources, but there's expertise, et cetera, that we need. And so maybe this is why in the 1990s, many, but not all proposals to cooperate came from the US and Europe. But I mean, we had cooperative multilateral engagements in many parts of the world before as well, Latin America, Africa, for example. And they're more and more being created. I mean, if you look at China, Russia, South Africa, Brazil, they all have proposed a multitude of different cooperative formats. The mic has an issue, sorry. I'm going to eat this thing in a second. Um, so like right, Russia, China, Brazil have created different kind of organizations. Just, I mean, you might have read about the Shanghai Cooperate, Co Cooperative Organization or the AIIB or UNASUR. So we have these different corporations going on. Um, the BRICS have now announced that they're going to enlarge. They become a larger and more div diverse group. And uh, lots of my IR colleagues have shown how many kinds of different international forums have been created that are not only formal deep cooperation, they're also informal, multi-stakeholder, just a plot, like a... I thought I was screaming, but I was not screaming enough. Um, so just to say, like, we have many actors who are pushing for multilateral cooperative formats, but these formats are like across the world, some of them are more regional, some are more global, some are more formal, some are more informal, some are more state-based, some are more multi-stakeholder based. So while cooperation is going on, and this gets back to also what you said in the introductory note, notes, Michalis, that actually what is maybe changing is the depth of cooperation. So thirdly, I just want to say that while cooperation is underway, and I don't necessarily see it as a decline, um, 
I think what John Ruggie talked about, this multilateralism with deep diffusing principles, that kind of cooperation is maybe not happening in all places. But I also don't think it ever happened in, in many places. We think too much of the EU and NATO when we think of international cooperation. And so, yes, cooperation might be transactional, might be short-lived uh, with very heterogeneous groups, uh, but that is not necessarily bad. I want to argue. Um, it's not necessarily bad. And also this kind of cooperation is also now pushed actually by plenty of actors, the US included. I mean, I recently wrote a, a piece with Yves Reikers, John Carlswood and others on ad hoc coalitions. And surprisingly to us, at least, there were quite a few governments, governments who were interested in this work because they're like, so how do we do ad hoc coalitions? We don't want to do that much formal deep cooperation anymore. Ad hoc coalitions seem to be very problem driven, purpose driven. How do we go about this? So in that sense, this kind of cooperation might actually ease some tensions and not create more. I think the jury is out on that. Coming to the question about how do we create even more cooperation and, and let's say global cooperation, um, because as I said, like the cooperation I observe is not only on the global level, but also on the regional level. So Fukuyama spoke about the end of history. If we look briefly across history, Unfortunately, the main pushes or many of the main pushes that came where we thought globally about how to actually create cooperation were after World War I, League of Nations, after World War II, the United Nations, after the Cold War, uh, by reviving the United Nations, right? So it seems as if, at least if history teaches us, a certain history teaches us a lesson, is that, that war is one way of thinking about cooperation. So now I hope that history will not repeat itself. Um, so let's look at another part of history, the 1970s. So the 1970s, actually, we observe um, the proposal of the new economic world order. And UNCTAD was, for example, created there. So apparently it is possible to think creatively, maybe experimentally, about more cooperation on the global level without having a major war. So I think it would be worthwhile, I will not give you a substantive answer, but it would be worthwhile to actually look a bit into the 70s and see what led to this kind of cooperation. What does that mean for the European Union? Given that that was also a question, um, is like to be more experimental, maybe not only let Macron push for all these different ideas. Macron is very keen on bringing all these different cooperative um, ideas on the EU table. But at the same time, be pretty careful about how you frame a policy challenge and policy opportunities. How do you call, what do you call a policy problem? I talked about this, uh, about migration very briefly, and I assume Tom will also talk about this when it comes to climate change. So how we frame policy problems, I think the EU can do a much better job in thinking through this. Uh, and maybe read more global historians. I mean, granted, at the EUI, my office is opposite Glenda Sluga, who's working on this a lot and talking to her makes me think about this too. But if we look back into history, uh, we might be able to actually come up or look, study different cosmopolitan, different internationalist ideas that can shift our mentality and our debate. Two very brief points, I apologize. Um, I also like Hilke trust actually some of the existing international organizations we have, especially organizations we call central or focal organizations where lots of expertise uh, is located that are hard to emulate. At least, I mean, I'm not an expert in development finance and development aid policies, but from what I read in the literature is that even though China has the AIIB many times, it actually also needs the World Bank to push for its programming when it comes to development finance. So there is something about these focal organization, some legacies that are important and that even those who might want to challenge some bargains, some multilateral deals will still continue to use. And while I also mentioned all these multilateral forums that have been created um, over time that could I think make us think that fragmentation is actually what we're observing. Another way of thinking about it is that having all of these multilateral actors, informal, formal, multi stakeholder there, eventually that might lead to adjustment pressures where different voices will actually push the conversation to a forum that needs to orchestrate these debates, like, for example, the United Nations, as we see at the moment with cyber. So it's not only about fragmentation, but adjustment pressures can also lead to more orchestration. Thank you very much.
Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Okay, Tom, you try the mic. Uh, it's going to be fine, I hope. This one. Yeah, yeah well, whichever, whichever you prefer. All right, I'll, I'll try this one if that works because it's a bit um, easier to handle. Mikhail, thank you so much for organizing this panel and bringing us all, you and your colleagues, to this beautiful city for this um, great discussion. Um, I want to speak about international order as it relates to the problem of climate change. Um, and I want to do so for two reasons, really. One, so I can respond to Mikhail's prompt and think a lot about the forward-looking aspects of this question, not just the past ones, but two, because I think we all should actually make a bit of a mistake in our discipline when we think about climate change or indeed security or human rights or migration or health or any of these other so-called issue areas as sort of the software and the institutions or the general political dynamics or the international order as the hardware, if you will. And the sort of discussion of international order tends to take place a little bit in an abstract sort of issue agnostic space, which I think isn't actually a particularly um, sophisticated political understanding of where institutions or orders come from and what they do. So I want to kind of make the argument that we should see climate change as not an issue area. Indeed, other things shouldn't be seen just as issue areas. It's one way to see the problem, but actually it's more interesting to think about how the international order relates to climate change, both as cause, how it drives climate change, but also as effect. How does climate change and how will climate change increasingly shape the international order and therefore everything else? So I just want to at least make two, two points, one on the causes and one on the effects of climate change and international order. Um, first, I think it's important to, to really understand that climate change as a problem is pretty deeply implicated into different parts of international order since the Industrial Revolution going forward. So obviously climate change comes from the mass use of fossil fuels. Why do we have the mass use of fossil fuels? Because we've industrialized the economy and that industrialization has spread over the entire continent to now reach a scale, sorry, the entire world across continents to reach a scale where we're actually altering the planet we live in through our economy. And that only happened or a necessary, perhaps even a sufficient condition, was a sort of spread of a certain mode of production around the world, very much connected to the political goals of different states and from them the order. So obviously we're talking about the competition between industrialized countries in the 19th and 20th centuries. We're talking about the use of colonialism and imperialism to secure fossil fuel assets throughout the 20th century, especially, particularly in the Middle East. And we're talking about the time, particularly actually since the 1970s in Stephanie's example, to ensure a steady and constant and relatively cheap supply of fossil fuels as a vital condition for maintaining economic stability. Um, and isn't it interesting that the expansion of BRICS just last week had, of the six countries that joined, three of them are a bit strangely huge oil and gas producers in the Gulf. So it's clearly that this idea of international order is pretty deeply tied to the fundamental political economy, that is at the heart of our of our climate change problem. Um, so, the conventional understanding of the international order has um, a good way of trying to understand how these kinds of problems might get solved. If we see this whole climate problem as an externality of modern industrial production, then we should try to solve it by having some kind of cooperation to overcome that externality, perhaps through some kind of burden sharing agreement. And as, as Hilke said and others have said, you know, we've had a great track record actually of many of those issues over the long period. There are hundreds of environmental treaties and they tend to follow a fairly similar model of saying uh, sort of a broad framework convention and then under that convention increasingly binding and specific commitments that have some sort of agreement of I'll do this if you do that, we'll have some kind of monitoring and more weekly, but still sometimes there's a bit of enforcement around it. And some of the great successes the international order has produced in the realm of environment come from this exact sort of problem solving toolkit. And of course, that's what countries did in 1992 when they agreed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. They sought to internalize this externality through the same sort of technology, institutional technology they had used previously. And it seems to seem like a really good um, test for can this order, which has contributed to this problem, also contribute to the solution. And here we are 31 years later. And obviously, we haven't seen as much progress on the problem-solving aspect to your definition of cooperation, uh, Mikhail, as we really would have need to have seen to show that this is actually an externality being internalized. And indeed, the sort of basic institutional technology 
of convention and protocols had kind of collapsed in 2009 with the Copenhagen summit and the switch in 2015 to this more bottom-up system under the Paris Agreement, which I think is actually a great example to Hilke's point of, of innovation and endurance and the ability of the international system to adapt, maybe a bit of a rare example um, of multilateralism overcoming gridlock, um, but still a pretty interesting one. But but no, even that institutional evasion aside, no one is, I think, at this point saying, yes, we've succeeded and we've solved the problem. And indeed, we're facing ever increasing emissions um, overall. So the international order has contributed to climate change and its solutions to the same problem have not yet been sufficient um, on the cause side of our equation. But how will climate change affect the international order? Will it make it easier to solve itself? Will it, hurt, will it harm it? Will it have repercussions and knock-on effects? And here I think um, there's a lot of reason to see the trends going toward the less cooperative outcomes that your framing, I think, speaks to become. Um, with some colleagues, Jess Col uh, Jessica Green and Jeff Colgan, I've tried to think about this through the lens of asset revaluation. So let me just briefly summarize why I think we should see the climate problem quite differently from how our conventional international order understanding has been and what that might mean. So we've often seen the climate problem as this big collective action thing, tragedy of the commons, and it has a very standard um, diagnostic that the solution I just described, a convention and protocol and commitments, transparency and enforcement is designed to solve and many other collective action problems we think of in the same way. But if instead we think about climate change as a process, as a dynamic process, and actually two interrelated processes, I think you get a very different diagnostic. So the thing we're talking about is essentially removing the source of all economic growth to a first approximation for the last 200 years. And we're talking about replacing that in a few short decades. And at the same time, that's a process of decarbonization. And at the same time, we're talking about the process of climate impacts increasingly shaping the physical environment in which we have to live. And so these two processes are happening at the same time, decarbonization and uh, climate impacts, and they're shifting the balance of interests and power around them as they proceed. So if you think about the world is divided into basically into asset classes like, say, oil tankers or pipelines or coal plants or air av aviation, that depends on climate forcing assets, and you distinguish that from those assets like beachfront property and farmers' fields and um, you know our, our quality of life in, in, this, in uh, September in a heat wave um, as being more sort of climate vulnerable assets, you can see that these two things are fundamentally in conflict with each other. And to the extent we have more climate change, the climate vulnerable, vulnerable assets will suffer. To the extent we have more decarbonization, the climate forcing assets will suffer. And of course, all of us to some degree have both some mix of these two things, but some of us have more of one than the other. Some of those assets maybe are quite easy to shift around, like say a bank can sell its shares in Exxon and buy shares in Tesla, for example, and maybe they're very hard to move because maybe a country's whole political economy, maybe the country itself was created out of a certain political economy that's quite specifically rooted in a certain kind of asset, which is very fossil intensive. Um, and so if the world's in that kind of way, how are these trends going to play out? They're going to have to be a contest between them. And the idea of having some sort of bargaining space where you agree to this much, if I agree to do that much, and we have some sort of international um, agreement to help us make that in Pareto enhancing bargain happen, just doesn't really make sense in a world where actually these two forces fundamentally are fighting for survival against each other. And we can only have ExxonMobil or Saudi Arabia or the Marshall Islands or Miami Beach in the their current forms. We can't have both of those things, right? One has to give. And so in that kind of much more stark, what we in our paper call an existential kind of politics, um, the cooperative bargains that I think have been the fundamental solution of the international order are much harder to imagine. So what are you going to see? I think it will, and we already are seeing a much more competitive approach the climate problem, more unilateral approaches. Um, I think that will, will probably proceed. Um, there's a lot of implications, I think, for international order, but this sort of fundamental one is around how the problem-solving technology the order has given to us may not be the thing that actually is dominating the politics of climate change going forward. And instead, it's going to be this much more bottom-up, competitive world, uh, I think, which is playing out before us. Final point I want to make before ending is just this is not necessarily a terrible thing. There are some positive aspects to this um, kind of competitive world, which I think um, come from the idea of having a more effective problem-solving 
methodology, which is basically overcoming the problem of obstructionism and just um, moving away from some of the um, less effective solutions we've seen around bargaining. And this is not you know, guaranteed to work, but given that the other <laughs> method was not has not yet proven itself to be particularly effective, um, it's sort of natural you see more um, ideas and policymakers and governments and activists thinking about this other kind of way of addressing the problem. And given that this is uh, solving the problem is kind of an existential question, not just for the assets I mentioned, but really for the international order we all depend on, I think it's probably worthwhile thinking about that as a positive thing. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Tom. Thanks a lot to all four speakers. We're going to open up straight away uh, so that you, we can involve you as uh, early on as possible. I would like to ask you, uh, if you want to pose a question, uh, raise your hand. We're going to bring you, Mike, uh, on this side or on this that side. I'm going to be pointing to you and, uh, uh, and guiding uh, our assistants. Uh, just remember, please, keep, ideally keep the questions, as I said, sharp and short. So please, first questions. So the first one is here. And then if you can raise a hand so that I'm, I'll try to keep track of that. And also, please introduce yourself and uh, tell us whom you are directing your question to. Hello. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Bruno. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge. Uh, my question is for Aisha. And um, I was wondering, you mentioned you'd expect more cooperation outside the West. And there's the example of the BRICS states, for instance, now with BRICS Plus. But it seemed that the states that were invited to participate, the, the Saudis, Argentina, and others, were quite hesitant, right? They wanted to read the fine print first before they sign up to this new deal. And I was wondering, is there really any non-Western order that we can see, or is there just more like different types of fragmentation trying to collaborate? But is it really a West versus the rest story? Was it? Do you see a more fragmented, more complex story lining up around the West? Thank you. We're going to try to collect. Uh, so please, uh, more questions. So, so just to the left uh, of the gentleman, actually, and uh, anybody else for the first round? Okay, you, you go ahead. Okay, thank you. My name is Burja Mangata, University of Göttingen. Uh, my question is to all participants, um, and I agree and I gather from this discussion that um, this international uh, liberal order was an ex maybe historical and geographical exception, uh, but we also have the issue of hegemonic leadership. Um, and maybe what we are seeing here is the decline in U.S. leadership, not just with Trump, but maybe starting also with Obama. And my question is, we still, at the end of the day, yes, uh, we might have better options with multilateralism after this uh, period, but we also have pressing issues like climate change. And can we do it without um, a leadership of uh, one country or a group of countries? Thank you. Okay, here at the front. If you can raise your hand to, so that they see. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yep. All right, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Håkon Saxe. I'm at the Norwegian Defense University College. At the, at the danger of perhaps simplifying too much, um, I would just like, like to uh, challenge the panel a little bit on, if, if we have to summarize in, in a few simple words what, what we see happening in the world, isn't it is it fair to say, or at least to what extent is it fair to say, that what is happening is simply the rise of the rest, uh, their economic rise, and therefore also their, 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 their increasing military power relative to that of the West. And as a consequence of that, their increasing assertiveness in international relations and conflict between the old Western-dominated order and, and states and the new rising powers in the rest of the world. Thank you. And whom do you want to address that to? Well, the whole panel, please. All right, so uh, who would like to start? Uh, we are going to try to go in these uh, batches of three, if that's okay. Anybody? Thank you for those questions. There's a strange echo in the room, so I didn't catch people's names, so I apologize. Um, but uh, I have a bit to say about each question. So the first one, which was directed to me, are we talking about... Um, you know, a non-Western order, uh, I mean, not yet. I don't think there is any order to what is happening. Uh, but I do think, and it's not just about the BRICS, that's just an example. I, I just think that there is increasingly more cooperation 
that excludes the West uh, and is often, uh, um, I mean, it's still, you know, mindful of what is the West doing. Is the West aware that we're doing this? You know, how look, you know, here we are doing this thing. Uh, see us, you know, there is a bit of that. Uh, but I think there's increasingly, um, you know, things happening uh, outside of the West where the West is uh, less relevant. Uh, whether that evolves into some kind of uh, new order, uh, I think remains to be seen. Uh, I do agree with what's been said that uh, much of this is happening within the institutions of, you know, the existing uh, order. But again, are we talking about, uh, you know, it for years and years, uh, we have assumed that uh, the maintenance of the international order is kind of the maintenance of Western uh, supremacy or centrality. And it may be that the international order survives, but Western centrality, uh, or whatever you call it, doesn't survive. I think maybe we need to be <laughs> aware uh, of, of that fact. So that's also relates to the question about is what's happening, you know, the rise of the rest. Uh, as I said, I, I do think it's about more agency outside, I, outside of the West. I don't think it's only about uh, military strength. Uh, I mean, the military testing of, you know, the West has come primarily from Russia, which is not a new kind of, you know, military power. Uh, I think it's more about uh, economic, social courage rather than military stuff alone. Um, and, you know, the question of can we solve um, problems without hegemonic leadership? I mean, my, my take on this is the bigger problem, I think, is the same as it is in you know domestic politics. Everybody knows that what they're against and what they're uh, not for, but nobody really makes uh, an argument for a substantive, uh, positive uh, future. We in the twentieth century we had uh, positive visions of the future uh, from different camps. Uh, and you need something like this, I think, to bring countries, people, et cetera, uh, together. So whether we're talking about climate change and so on. Um, and I think the, the argument, oh, we don't want X, uh, whether that's a person or like a bad outcome, only temporarily, uh, you know, uh, brings uh, people together. But it's not sustainable. And that's what makes me worry about the future of, you know, the international order more than the absence of, you know, hegemonic leadership by a country. It's the absence of a positive, substantive vision. Thanks for these great questions. I want to pick up on kind of all of them with, with kind of two cross-cutting themes. Um, and one really essentially tied to the second question around leadership. Do you need hegemonic leadership to have Global public good solving. I, I um, infer your question to, to say. I think um, I think you need to have conditions under which, uh, for climate change specifically, but also for a number of the challenges we face, including COVID, is a really good example too. Under which the largest countries, the great powers, are incentivized to provide some kind of contribution to public goods. Now, is that because of a sort of post 1990s world of hegemonic U.S. leadership? I'm not sure there's a great evidence for that. Actually, I suggest the evidence shows that the biggest resource transfers internationally come during moments of competition, during wars, during Cold War, um, and that that's what really has motivated great powers to make um, these kinds of contributions in the past. So I don't think the more competitive world we have is actually one that is more further away from this kind of problem. Actually, there are pathways to which it could be, could be closer. And the second thing is I think the... Um, the power of coalitions here, I think, is really interesting. And we're talking about the BRICS. And you know, if you were designing from scratch, what is the most least um, cohesive group? You know, it'd be kind of hard to do worse than to have the twelve countries that are currently in the BRICS. So right? you have three country, three pairs of quite bitter rivals in there, um, and a number of others who who are quite different groups, but they're united indeed by a desire that we don't really like a kind of overly Western-centric world, which is um, kind of being what you're against, not what you're for, right? So 
so there's a lot of scope for, I think, new, more creative coalitions. And I'd point to the Bridgetown Initiative as a really interesting idea, this proposal from Barbados to have pretty structural reforms, the international financial institutions, which has, through a bit of charismatic leadership, and you know, tapped into a, a kind of interesting coalition that I think could lead to bigger transformation. So I think there's a real scope for, for more creative coalitions. I don't think it's gonna be the BRICS though. Just very briefly also on, on the question of leadership. I think, I mean, you need people with ideas and resources to pursue certain projects. I completely agree. I don't know whether it needs to be the hegemon to do so. And just as a small uh, footnote here, I mean, hegemons also have created problems, not only solved problems, right? I mean, so in that sense, we can also ask the question, maybe without a hegemon, we would have less problems at times. Right, excellent. More questions from the audience. Anybody? Yeah, go ahead, so person. Great. Uh, my, my name is Farzan Gassen from the University of Oxford. Uh, thanks a lot to the speakers and to Michel for organizing this. Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, question one and questioning of the premises of question one, I think. Um, and uh, basically, in, in response to question two, I mean, the thing that stuck with me with Aisha's statement on let's be more honest as the West. Um, but I mean, moving beyond that, what's the um, what? What can we what can we build from that? Right. I mean, the the, the urgency to build an international system or to reform the international system to address the challenges that we're facing is there. Uh, it's not exactly the kind of Cold War moment or the Second World War moment, but it is there. Um, so, what steps do you see that should be taken in terms of institutional reforms, uh, for example? Um, and uh, yeah, is is the multilateral order as we've as we have it and as we've built it uh, sufficient, or are there is there a different type of international institution that we or global institution that we need to build to address the uh, challenges that we're facing? Thank, thank you very much, uh, Farzan, for that. And, and I'm just going to zoom in now on, on the specific role of the EU and, and Europe. Um, and I think this was also exactly the type of question that we asked ourselves about one and a half years back. You know, we see all these things coming down. You know, what, what can Europe do, right, um, as, as key stakeholders in international relations? So we went around, you know, um, interviewing all sorts of people in high-level places who are, you know, thinking strategically about these questions in the External Action Service, the Commission, Council, um, all of the EU delegations around the world, from from Beijing to Washington to to the UN, um, and I think what we've seen is that um, Europe and the EU have been really quite good um, at type of defending the status quo. They've really stepped into these type of gaps um, that that appeared under the Trump administration um, and so forth. Um, this has involved creating new type of coalitions. Europe often didn't do much with Mexico. Well, they reached out to Mexico, hey, there's another country and that perhaps might share some of our issues. Can we do something um, with them? Um, they did so initially on the on the Global Compact for Migration, um, which didn't turn out going very well, but that was more on the on the European side. Um, the EU has been obviously paying for a lot of things um, as well. Uh, when there were shortcuts in the World Health Organization or elsewhere in the system, um, the UN system, the EU simply, you know, paid up. Um, the EU has been um, also, you know, pushing uh, in terms of its diplomatic service tremendously. So at a certain point, um, there was a moment in the UN system where China was about to get the fifth leadership position of a UN agency, which was under, there was the, uh, if I recall correctly, International Telecom Union, um, where at that point, um, you know, EU member states together with the US said, well, you know, this, this is enough. And they really started pushing back to that, creating diplomatic coalitions um, with, with other member states. So I think there's, there's a lot of that type of things um, going on. What's, what's much harder um, is indeed to make that, that transformative move forward, um, precisely also because, you know, the status quo tends to benefit uh, a number of, of European member states. Think about the seats in the World Bank, IMF, um, and so forth. Um, so if I'm thinking, you know, um, uh, strategically about that, um, within Europe, we're probably going to have to make some trade-offs um, between, you know, defending the things that we have, uh, but also perhaps letting go of, of some of our current levers of, of influence in these institutions in order really 
and to transform them. Um, but perhaps if I may, just one final final point on, on, the, on the previous round of questions. I heard a lot of people back talking about states, right? It was a very 19th century type of states discussion. Um, I'm hoping that we're now in the 20th century and that states are no longer the only 21st century, exactly. Um, thank you. Um, uh, that states are no longer the only you know, type of actors uh, around, uh, that there are institutions, that there are norms, um, that there are you know, appropriate behaviors um, that, that we're also respecting. So I think we do need to move a bit around um, you know, that, that really state focused of the rise of the, of the rest. Um, I think the the climate example of Farsan gives a really good case of where there's a, a quick win on the dimensions you're, you're thinking about. And I think the more competitive framework helps us understand it. So both the United States and the European Union have made um, a, a way of changing their economies toward a climate goal. The U.S. model is very unconcerned about the world trade compatibility, world trade organization compatibility of it. The EU, EU, European model has been very concerned about that. But fundamentally, both are about imposing costs on those who aren't participating in a way that benefits domestic producers. Um, and it's been very domestically driven, right? The CBAM in Europe has been designed basically to make Europe safe for ambitious climate policy by neutralizing domestic political opposition. Same in the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act. Neither actor has thought hard about what would actually be the most strategic way to position this kind of shift to have leverage on global decarbonization, not our own domestic political climate politics. And rather, how do we use it to build coalitions that could work? So the EU CBAM has been earmarked to refund the EU's COVID-19 debt. What if it had actually said it's going to be an investment fund for Africa's green economy, to bring a path for the green economy for African countries? All right, this is like a, a sort of very small but basic step that um, I think a, a different way of thinking about this sort of climate problem why it's not a one of cooperation, but of how to build coalitions for winning the new green economy, as, as um, politicians like to put it, um, could really be done. This might sound maybe very naive, but um, uh, sometimes I still feel like the U.S. This reflex of cooperation has to be deep, has to be regulatory, right, has to be formal, etc. And so maybe one way of also addressing this question of what you ask about institutional reforms and how to think about it too. It's like thinking about multilateral cooperation as an incremental process of cooperating, right? Where you have different kind of forums where actually ideas can be exchanged before you actually talk about the deep cooperation regulatory stuff that actually one wants to push for. And so if you think about the G20 and inviting the African Union in, maybe that's a forum really where, where you can actually talk more broadly with different stakeholders about the, the, the challenges and problems that they see define have to face every day and how they would like to them to be addressed. To so think about actually cooperation, not on this like here we meet as heads of states in in a very intergovernmental structure, but incrementally thinking of different processes that include more actors. Okay, more questions? Yeah, I see one there. Uh, please raise your hand also in advance so that I can see. Yeah, can you pass the mic there in the middle? Thank you. I'm Lisbeth Zimmermann from Frankfurt University. Um, I, I think uh, I want to push you a little bit on the normative vision that I also mentioned. So what, what you're saying, and I completely agree, is, um, well, what we call the liberal international order might have been hypocritical at best most of the time anyways. Um, we see a lot of resilience in international institutions, is what Hilke told us, um, and we see some kind of changes, more diversity, more voices, and so on, and that's kind of a pragmatic thing to cope with it, I think I get from Stephanie, um, uh, because, you know, power has just changed, there are more people, but there's also a normative vision somehow involved in the sense that it's right that there is more voices at the table and that there's more diversity and that it's a good thing and that is the justice thing somehow involved right um but then i wonder how far you can push that argument and if we still have to kind of say that red lines or that tipping points right so is it just you know it's not that only 
power and economic status has somehow changed, but societies in the world have also changed. So you see kind of democratic backsliding, you see a rise of the far right in all parts of the world, right? So somehow societies are really changing. And so that, of course, substantively somehow changes what's going on in world politics. So is there like a red line, something still kind of rights oriented or social progressively social justice oriented red lines and how far you can go with the diversity and, you know, more points of views and more people at the table argument. Any other question right now? Uh, yeah. Uh, here at the front, please. Uh, Didam Soyalton from University of Aberdeen. Maybe a bit connected with the previous question and maybe Stephanie, you are the best target for this question. I was also wondering when we, when you are talking about ordering, you are also thinking about not liberal, but illiberal ordering, you know, authoritarian the clubs like original organizations are creating their own informal networks. We are talking about autocratic clubs, right? Like ASEAN or Gulf Association or, or um, Shanghai Corporation. So when you are saying ordering, what kind of principles you know, this kind of building blocks you are referring, or this is also, again, you know, questions that we are asking from West when we say, you know, framing this organization as illiberal or, you know, authoritarian, or is it, or there is this kind of, you know, line that when we talk about diversity. Well, anything else right now? Nope. And then, uh, Stephanie, do you want to start? And then we go to the previous question. You think it's not good, this one? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the question. So I think there are actually two questions, and maybe I wasn't clear enough in my elaborations, because in a way I hear you say, like, what ought to be, while I was trying to see how I see it is, right? So in, in a way, I mean, so, so for me... Yes, of course, the ordering is happening based on various kinds of principles. That's what I meant to say with like China pushing for the uh, development to peace approach, Russia with the sphere of influence. I didn't want to evaluate them per se, normatively speaking, just outline that because they exist and because they actually are pursued in different places in the world, institutionally speaking, but also geographically speaking, I have a hard time seeing this red line, seeing these principles that are actually defining the order in which all of this is happening, right? So to me, a world where this developmental peace approach and the sphere of influence approach, I mean, Russia invaded Ukraine, there is a war. Is that a red line? Apparently not, because the war is still going on. So in that sense, to me, then hence I have a hard time talking about order when I look at it from, from, from my I still call it issue area, but I get the point uh, um, perspective, right? So, and then there's the aspirational approach as to how the art world ought to be. And that I think hopefully we all have certain kind of answers for this, but like my argument about thinking through these different ordering stream, um, streams and having, like making this visible, it is also in a way, a way of finger pointing to those who push or argue this liberal international order was so liberal because as far as I read liberalism or political liberalism in particular, being inclusive, being equal actually is part of, of a liberal order and it just never has been this way, right? So these, to include these voices would be actually more liberal of those who want a liberal international order. This may be a lame answer, but I hope it, it made sense. Like for me, it's like the is and the order very different here. Thank you. Um, I'll just reflect a little bit about, uh, on the last two questions plus the one from the previous round I didn't get the answer. Uh, so this issue of hypocrisy actually is quite complicated. Um, because all orders have, uh, you know, uh, ways that they legitimate themselves. They are built and justified according to certain principles. And when you have that, there's going to be a degree of hypocrisy. I mean, there there, there was hypocrisy, uh, you know, on the uh, on the Soviet side. You know, <laughs> there was. Uh, I've studied, you know, Asian orders and you know, in the early modern era, which legitimated themselves by conquest, and the moment they stopped expanding, they were, you know, in some ways hypocritical. So some of it is avoidable. 
uh, and maybe necessary because it's actually having certain principles, having a kind of a vision, an ideal, like makes the order to some extent accountable. Maybe you know we can we can debate <laughs> uses of uh, hypocrisy, degrees of hypocrisy. But when I say the EU, when I talk about the EU and say you know cut it out, I think there is greater hypocrisy than there needs to be that creates uh, great resentments. I mean, I'll speak with a specific example of EU, uh, you know, Turkey relations, um, making deals with Erdogan, like about <laughs> refugees, in the meantime, torturing uh, pro-EU Western uh, Turks, westernized Turks, or whatever you call them, uh, with like real torturous uh, visa regimes, uh, humiliating, humiliating uh, procedures, uh, and then to be rejected uh, for like, you know, I mean, Twitter is full of stories, you can go find uh, all these, I mean, it's just some kind of transparent tourist visa regime, some kind of, you know, uh, um, merit-based, I don't know, uh, migration model. Like there are a lot of things that the EU uh, could do that it doesn't do. And at the same time, uh, you know, uh, again, I, I fully support the idea that, you know, Europe is supporting Ukraine, but it's very different, right? Like we, we know it's very different. Um, and I'm not trying to make, anyway. So it looks uh, for Turks, for people, in other parts of the world uh, than for the EU or like the West to say like, why don't you support our very <laughs> legitimate cause? It, it just doesn't resonate. But when, you know, Erdogan and Putin say like, look at them, you know, they're full of double standards. Uh, they've been treating you like crap, you know, that resonates. It, it resonates even with people who agree with the principles and ideals that the EU stands for and the, and the West has stood for. That's that's what I mean uh, about this hypocrisy issue. If I may, I want to challenge you a bit uh, because I think uh, to a large extent, this is like a very European uh, perspective uh, in that like, uh, yeah, uh, the, the West has been dominating the game and it cannot dominate it anymore. So it's go it will need to step down a bit. It's going to need to be replaced or joined by the new newcomers. And I'm just uh, wondering uh, how uh, more, let's say, US-based IR audience uh, or scholarship uh, would look at that. Do you believe that? I mean, if we put it very harshly, and I would like to ask that to anyone of the panel who will, who will be interested, do you think that... Um, that the U.S. Uh, as the hegemon in decline will be happy with that perspective saying, okay, it's going to be us, but also China and India and others? Or is it likely that they will actually have a serious internal issue and serious internal problem with the fact that they should admit that the order isn't Western? And uh, connecting it to what also Hil Hilke was referring to a bit um, about this extension of cooperation into these new areas. So we have climate change on the one hand, which Tom was talking about, and not very positively, not very optimistically. And the other one, uh, the other uh, game in town emerging with, so the AI uh, and cooperation, ability of states to cooperate on some basic regulation of competition if uh, in uh, the development of the, uh, and the use of AI technology for whatever uh, hostile purposes. So can, can you imagine, can you envision that in 10 years from now, we will be in a situation in which the major powers are actually able to agree on some substantive deep cooperation that will actually solve the problems rather than just let's have something flexible, let's have something, yeah, you know, ad hoc, maybe a bit of that. Do, do you see that as a possibility? Or are we like just, is this time gone? This type of deep cooperation led by, a, let's say, a concert of a couple of major powers which agree on a common purpose in that cooperation. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Michael. And if I can just connect this also with the previous question on, on normative orders, which, which I thought was great. I mean, rereading the article by John Ruggie on multilateralism in 1992, I think one of the one of the key um, points that he makes is that it mattered that the post-war system developed under American he hegemony, and then he puts American in italics. Um, because for him, you know, these type of, of values that the, that the hegemon brought, um, you know, created 
the type of multilateralist system that was open, where there's reciprocity and, and all the other things that Stephanie has mentioned. And then he explicitly in his art, article also refers to alternative models, say Nazi Germany, which created, adopted a very strategic type of trans transactionalist bilateralism um, in international relations to all sorts of other, other countries. So um, for John Ruggi, I think the American bit um, is critical. Um, and it's not that I fully disagree, but I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of distance because I'm, I'm also thinking about the type of more functionalist arguments. I mean, when you think of creating international cooperation in, in, in general terms, you know, there are not that many ways you can, you can design it. I mean, if you have a trade agreement where you both um, agree to reduce tariffs, um, for that to be effective, there are going to have to be some credible commitments, which likely is going to be in the form of an arbitration court. Now, you know, that counts for trade agreements that the Americans develop, that the Europeans develop, but also if China wants to trade with any country, it's going to have to think ab about those type of things. Um, and I think particularly China uh, realized that when negotiating, and Stephanie mentioned before, the uh, the uh, AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, you know, if you want to get money from the financial markets for your pet project international organization, you're going to have to fulfill some standards of accountability, openness, and all the other things that the international bankers, bankers asked for. Um, so ultimately, if you, if you talk to the people who actually know more about this institution than I do, um, you see that it has resemblance of, of traditional type of type of development banks and the, the outreach to the World Bank, I think, is also critical. And that also brings me to some of the other forums, like, you know, the BRICS and the BRICS extension. Um, we, we, we had a had debate earlier also with one of my former postdocs who, who's writing a paper on hollow multilateralism, um, saying, you know, that there's not much to this type of multilateralism. And the BRICS, you know, whether we agree or not, I mean, it's ultimately a marriage of convenience, right? was put in an, you know, the acronym was put together by, uh, by an economist of Goldman Sachs. They met particularly beyond the, um, the economic and financial crisis when the IMF needed more money. And, and then it was full steam ahead for the Chinese and the rest was left behind. So the way I see this, this extension is, is not as, as another challenge to the West, is, is rather trying to save the forum. Um, because otherwise, it's simply not going to go anywhere. It's China, China, and the rest. You know, Putin couldn't even make it to the summit because the South Africans wouldn't let him in because of the indictment by the International Criminal Court. So, so I'm not necessarily convinced that these type of more informal, limited, institutionalized forums are, are really going to be the um, the things that that's going to move these uh, these international orders. So I think there's lots of scope for effective cooperation um, on climate change and other issues in the coming coming years. You know, one scenario in this kind of contest between fossil fuel based assets and climate vulnerable assets could very well be that there's a critical mass that tips toward the sort of decarbonization world. I think the war in Ukraine has really accelerated Europe's path in that direction on the, in the medium term. Uh, the United States is very much on the fence and the next election will be critical, but there's a real chance now, which there wasn't even 18 months ago, that the United States will actually be um, one of the faster decarbonizers, which is kind of baffling, but um, well, very welcome. And and you could have a world where actually the major economies all are moving in this direction with a few strong holdouts, fossil, you know, petro states essentially, and the politics of climate change looks much less cooperative, much more coercive, where essentially the kind of critical mass of large economies are putting pressure through sanctions, through trade measures, and maybe with compensation or positive care as well onto the kind of state sort of like a non-proliferation treaty um, kind of look as opposed to a, a multilateral look. So I think in this sort of more competitive world, there's lots of cooperation that can take place there, even though it's not necessarily in the exact same form. You mentioned AI. Here's one where I think over many kinds of emerging technologies, there's a fundamental difference between those that have a kind of military application and those that don't. And I think the, the real risk with AI is that um, even though there's, I think, very much progress since we big summit on it this fall, right, um, to get some sort of let's have a bit of constraint on the commercial use of it, and um, I think that will be the outcome of the summit this fall. Um, we just don't know. I, I certainly don't know. Maybe one of you does. What exactly is going on in different military development for, for, um, operations around the world? And 
unless intelligence services are really, really good, they're not going to know what they're, they're doing either. So there's a real kind of arms race dynamic there, which I think is hard to imagine um, a cooperative outcome around in the near term. Okay, more questions. Anything from the audience? Everybody's tired after four days of conferencing, right? If if not at this stage, then I would probably suggest that uh, I give it back uh, to the panelists for the last round and ask them if they want to make any uh, any uh, concluding remarks, maybe pitching what they consider to be, again, going back to the very questions. I mean, if you want to be on the positive side, pick one one thing where you think it makes sense for us political scientists to actually focus on uh, in, in terms of teaching, in terms of talking to the journalists and others, what the EU or other actors in this regard should be doing. If you can, if we can have that quick conclusion. I mean, this is, it's a difficult task, but I will still want to push you into the into the original questions. Is that okay if we go in the in the reverse order and start with uh, with Tom now? So I want to end with a note of optimism, which is um, we are seeing really exciting new forms of cooperation emerge around climate change. This week, there's a summit, the first summit held, hosted by an African country in Kenya on, on climate change, which is, um, and the message there was not the same one we've heard before of, um, you know, we're, we haven't contributed to the problem, we're very vulnerable, it's a grave injustice, that's certainly strong in people's minds, but the narrative was all about, this is a huge opportunity for the continent to have a new growth model that's going to be much more feasible and sustainable for us in the long run. Um, and to see that, you know, 22, I think, African heads of states were there signing a declaration along these lines, shows, I think, the potential where a really positive cooperative outcome can emerge. It's not a global, you know, deal kind of vision of it, but it's concrete cooperation amongst a new coalition, which I think is great news. One positive aspect is that I got a microphone that works thanks to uh, you all the time, so thank you very much. Um, but um, maybe more looking into the debates we have also uh, within international relations is that, uh, yes, I mean, I think for a long time we were first primed to look at cooperation through, and sorry, maybe I repeat myself, formal organizations, but what we observe is that there's lots of different organizations organizational formal uh, forms going on, like formal, informal ones. Um, and we have multi-stakeholder approaches where different private and civil society actors together with actually um, state actors are trying to, to define and then solve global uh, problems. We saw this in the health sector, for example. So I do think if we actually open our minds a little bit more to looking at cooperation in different parts in cooperative formats that are articulated differently than the ones we are used to as having grown up, for example, in the European Union, then actually we see more cooperation going on. Um, while the world was probably fighting COVID, um, the UN Secretary General uh, Guterres wrote a fantastic report uh, on our common agenda. Now this month at the UNGA summit, um, there's going to be a ministerial meeting discussing this report and the step forwards. Um, and next year, in 2024, we're going to have a summit for the future um, run by the Secretary General. Um, now, these are ambitious plans that move beyond states uh, that are about the access of civil society to our global uh, institutions uh, where youth plays a role. Um, I think we should be talking much more um, about these these plans um, and also providing them with with our full support. Now uh, you create a danger that will end on a uh, negative note by making me the last speaker. But <laughs> no, no, I, I'll try to emphasize something that uh, I personally find a, a positive. I mean. When I came into international relations as a graduate student and was exposed to this literature about institutions, corporations, etc., I felt quite alienated from it, not because the scholarship isn't uh, excellent, but because it seemed to describe a world that I had never experienced or seen. So um, it just didn't speak to me uh, personally. Uh, I think what is happening as a result of maybe the <laughs> the disorder or the tumult of the last decades or so is that 
uh, the real world uh, as I know it <laughs> and, uh, and other parts of the world maybe and the, uh, the literature are coming closer so it's not just maybe it won't be just a literature or scholarship about Europe anymore but uh, will emerge from this period as uh, uh, as a more robust, rep globally representative uh, scholarship. So I find that to be a positive. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to uh, uh, all the panelists and thanks a lot to you for staying, each, uh, staying with us. Um, these are obviously very difficult topics uh, to talk about and uh, but at the same time fundamental in the sense that how the order looks like or what it looks like in the coming years and decades is going to have an impact on all the individual issue areas in some regards. Maybe in some it's going to work better, maybe in others it's going to be far more far more conflictual than uh, perhaps than it is now. Uh, so anyway, let me just conclude by thanking again uh, and giving a round of applause to all the panelists who joined us today. And let me thank you all for, for joining us on this beautiful afternoon. Enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the conference and your stay in Prague. Bye-bye.